All right. I'll wait about two minutes before resuming here. Ah, oh, good. Give people a chance to come back. Good. Here they come. I'm going to wait until 10 o'clock, so it's about a minute and a half now. Give people time to come back. One more minute. All right. Well, I guess everyone's back that uh, they've had their chance. Maybe they'll wander in later. Anyway, we'll go on to cryptographic attacks. So the simplest attack to understand is the brute force attack. Here, let me just rearrange my screen a little. Uh, I'm not sure how much of this stuff in my way projects to you, but anyway, that makes it a little cleaner. All right. This is just where you try every possible key. Uh, another form is where you try every possible combination of letters for a password, and all you have to do to prevent this is make the key long enough that it takes too long to try them all. Uh, 2 to the 128 is more calculations than any known computer can make given any amount of time, and so uh, that's long enough for a symmetric key. 2048 bits is what you need for an RSA key because it is more complicated and you don't have to try all possible keys in that case. But anyway, um, that's a brute force attack. In principle, it will always work. Your only um, defense is having the key long enough. And as I already mentioned, the one-time pad is a special case where the brute force attack fails for a different reason. You will generate all possible plain texts as you try every key, so you can't tell which one of them is the correct, me correct message. So even if you had enough time to try every possible key, you still would not know what the secret message was. Social engineering is, of course, a very powerful attack where you just trick someone into making a mistake. This is very dangerous, very hard to patch, and uh, very difficult for anyone to cope with. Rainbow tables are a common way to make cryptographic attacks faster by trading time for memory. So you make some kind of pre-computed table, like a multiplication table, and store it in memory, and that makes the calculations faster because you look up things instead of recalculating them over and over. This turned out to be very effective against the hashes used by Windows before Windows Vista, but modern hash algorithms benefit less from rainbow tables. If you can guess or indeed feed in plain text to be encrypted, this makes other mathematical attacks possible. Uh, this is the way fast web cracks works. You would guess the portions of ARP packets because ARP packets are very much all the same, and then you would pump a lot of ARP packets through very fast and get um, encrypted versions of plain text you know, and that makes some mathematical attacks possible to crack it faster. Chosen plain text is another way where if you can pump in very carefully chosen text, which is then encrypted, you can deduce something about the key, and this is a padding oracle attack, so a whole series of these that trick a block cipher into adding padding at the end, which you can predict, and then you can deduce information about the key. This has turned out to be very powerful, and there's a whole series of attacks 
against uh, HTTPS that work, but they're fairly difficult to do in practice. They involve sending millions of carefully chosen uh, plain text up to be encrypted. And so, uh, but the main thing these things have done is cause people to take another look at stream suckers like RD4, RC4. Unfortunately, RC4 has its own weakness, and we've sort of bounced back and forth between stream ciphers to avoid padding oracles and block ciphers to avoid the uh, imperfections of stream ciphers, which is that they are not white. Uh, RC4 has a defect that it does not produce every possible byte with the same frequency. The byte 127 is slightly more likely to occur, and with a very large amount of encrypted text, you can deduce something about the key from that. So neither system is perfect, and we bounce back and forth from one to the other as the decades pass. <clears throat> Meet in the middle attack is very devastating. If, you're, if the mathematical steps of your cryptography can be done halfway, and you can figure out what half of the encryption process is, then you, instead of cracking, say, one 128-bit key with two to the 128 operations, you can take the plain text and go halfway and take the cipher text and come halfway back. So you reduce a problem from a 128-bit problem to two 64-bit problems. And that means the complexity is taken down to the square root. So this is very dangerous, and this is why you can't use double DES. I mentioned before, a person might imagine that if a DES encryption is weak, all you have to do is do another round of DES encryption, and it'll be stronger. But that turns out to do almost no good at all, because then you can very easily do a meet-in-the-middle attack. Uh, that's why people actually use triple DES, because if you break it into three pieces, then there's no way to split it without having one piece at least have two rounds of DES, and that is strong enough. And that's why triple DES, where I, one DES has a 56-bit key, triple DES is considered as secure as 112 bits, because the meet-in-the-middle attack means that one step of it will have two DESs. Another thing is with known key, if somehow the key can be guessed or some information about the key can be deduced, then of course you can make an attack that's faster than a brute force attack, but this is why people try to use dictionaries of stolen passwords or dictionaries of English words. This is why there was an attack from UC Berkeley a few years ago where they turned on a webcam microphone and listened to the sound of people typing. And from the sound, they could deduce some information about their password. So you don't really have to try every possible password. Differential cryptanalysis is another technique that was a military secret when DES was uh, designed, but it was reinvented by people on the outside and is now well known, where you encrypt two plain texts that are differ only by one or a few bits, and then you do a statistical analysis of the ciphertext, and you can deduce something about the key unless the algorithm is carefully designed to prevent this. Side channel attacks are very deadly. This is where you find when you actually implement one of these mathematical systems in real hardware, something leaks out about the key. For example, it might it takes longer to calculate when you have a bit, a bit of one in the key than if it's a bit of zero. So by just timing how long it takes to do the calculation, you get information about the key. You can look at the radio signals that are emitted by the wires during encryption and find information about the key. You can look at the power consumption of the processor during the encryption and deduce things about the key. And all these attacks have been done. <coughs> they are not flaws in the math. They are flaws in the actual implementation in real hardware, and this is very difficult. All right, implementation attacks are another one where you find uh, some other error being made in the way you implemented it, such as leaving a copy of the plain text somewhere or the key somewhere. Uh, this is what I found to be true of many Android apps. I've been giving talks for years about this. An enormous number of Android apps make an extra unnecessary copy of your password and store it in the operating system on your phone. So they undo all the beautiful, you know, mathematical perfection of the encryption by just making an extra copy of the secret and leaving it lying around in an unsafe place. The birthday attack is used to find collisions in hash functions. 
MD5, for example, has 128 bits, so you might imagine that you would have to try two to the 128 files before you'll be lucky enough to find two that hash the same value, but that's not true, and this is from a familiar classroom demonstration. If you have 23 people in your class and you just go around the room and ask for their birthday, and this guy's born on October 1 and that person on August 17 and so on, it's very likely that two of them will have the same birthday because the number of pairs of people is much larger than the number of individual people. So if you have two to the 64 files, the number of pairs of files is almost 200 and one, two to the 128 right there. So that's why a hash function has to have an output that is twice as long as the largest number of files you can test. So 128 is not enough, 160 in SHA-1, is now turned out not to be enough, but that's only because there are weaknesses in the system. But we now prefer SHA hashes of 256 bits or longer in practice in the SHA-2 family, so that even half of that is still too many calculations to do. All right, so to implement cryptography, um, here is another issue I mentioned before. It is often essential to know who said something so they cannot deny it later. So you can do something like sign a loan agreement. So for this, you use digital signatures. You have some message like they've shown here, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. All right. So there's some message and you want to sign it. This does not make the message secret. It's just a signature that, that shows who wrote it. So you calculate the SHA-1 hash of the message and get that number. Then you encrypt it with your private key. That's called the digital signature. You can append that to the end of the message and anybody can take your public key, which is common knowledge, and verify that it decrypts this signature down to a hash value and then they can calculate the hash value of the message and if it matches, that proves that you signed it and it proves that no one altered it because the hash value matches. So that's a digital signature good enough for financial transactions over the internet. And you need private key cryptography or public key cryptography to do that. The only reason, because there has to be only one person that has the private key. If you had a shared secret system where two people had the private key, you couldn't do it this way because you'd never know if the bank made the signature or if the borrower made the signature. But in public key cryptography, they each have their own separate private key so they can sign something with high degree of, of certainty that they won't be able to deny it later. So here's just the verification process. They take the message, calculate the SHA, get the hash, then they take the digital signature, decrypt it with the public key, and compare the hashes. And if those two things match, that means that this document is unaltered and was signed by that person. Message authentication codes are used for a similar purpose. This uses hashing and a shared secret uh, this provides integrity and authenticity and is used commonly in financial transactions. One technique is CBC Mac that uses DES and CBC and Mac, uh, DES and, and cipher block chaining. HMAC is another system, hashed message authentication code that uses a shared secret and a hashing algorithm. And there is HMAC MD5 and HMAC SHA-1 and other systems. And these are very commonly used in financial transactions with a shared secret and a hash so that you can know that the trust, you know who's sending it and you know that it hasn't been altered in transit. For HTTPS websites, for people to log in on the internet, <coughs> you use the public key infrastructure. This is a network of servers that handle digital certificates. You purchase it from a certificate authority who charges money for this usually, although there are a few free ones like Let's Encrypt. And they then run servers which will verify these certificates on demand. So uh, you can have individual certificates bound to a person, but the most common type are just bound to a server and they live on the server. Um, so you have certificate authorities that issue these certificates and revoke them when they are no longer uh, trustworthy because some secret has leaked. Then you have registration authorities that authenticate users and sell certificates to them. Um, and certificate holders are typically companies like Google that run a server that's running HTTPS. Then you have clients that are running browsers and they can validate signatures by using these uh, public certificates. And the repositories hold the certificates, verify them on demand, and have certificate revocation lists to indicate which certificates should no longer be trusted. Uh, the CRL system is very old and it doesn't work very well. 
One of the techniques of replacing it is the online certificate status protocol. This is one of the weaknesses in the current system is how to really revoke a certificate if it is compromised. Uh, it's, it's a problematic part of the system. Key management is a problem. If you have a public key and you put it in a certificate on a server, then you have to keep the private key so it's available to read the data coming in and you have to back it up somehow. So if your server crashes, you don't lose it, but you can't let other people have it or it'll compromise the integrity of the system. So there are various techniques and one technique is key escrow where you have a trusted third party that holds the key or you break the key into pieces and you give several third parties just part of the key so you can get them all to come to, get, to give you the pieces and you can reassemble it, but no one of those parties would be able to decrypt messages. Another form of key escrow, which is important and built into a lot of Microsoft products, although never implemented yet, is if the FBI and the government ever does succeed in demanding that we give them all our private keys, Microsoft has written software that has the ability to do that, always send an extra copy of the private key to some government agency. And uh, there are governments that do require that, but not the American government at the moment. Anyway, SSL and TLS uh, are used to, for internet traffic. SSL was the original system. It is now completely obsolete and considered un insecure in all of its forms. So when people talk about using SSL, they're really being sort of making a slang statement. What's really being used is the replacement TLS, Transaction Layer Security, which works in a very similar way, but is much stronger and safer. So the handshake looks like this. Let me get it set up so I can point to things here. This is a Wireshark trace. So if I connect to a secure server, the first thing that happens is my browser chooses a high local port, like 61,048 here, and then it sends a SYN up to the server on port 443. The server replies with SYN ACK, and I reply with ACK. That completes the TCP handshake, so we can now send data back and forth. There is, however, no encryption on that data, so now we have to have another exchange. The client sends a client hello message that tells the server, I am a browser, I am Chrome version 59, I can speak these 14 cryptographic protocols, which one would you like to use? The server says ACK, saying I received the message, then the server sends you a hello saying, okay, I am a server running IIS version 7, here's what I can speak, how about we use this one? And so you choose a, a, a cryptographic protocol, and then you have a certificate that comes down. Your browser verifies the certificate with a trusted third party, and then you have a key exchange, and you create a session ticket, which is where you agree on the public key, then create an AES key and send it with public key encryption to the server. So now you have a shared secret, and now you can exchange data back and forth using rapid AES encryption with a high degree of security. And all that is the complicated back and forth that has to happen to complete the SSL, or proper, more properly, the TLS connection. All right, IPsec is another version of encryption that's used on the internet. Uh, this came with IP version 6, and it was so valuable, it was backported to IP version 4. It is considered the most complicated cryptographic system, but it is also considered very secure. Uh, you can use it with an authenticated header mode or an encapsulated security payload mode. It um, uses ISACAMP and IKE protocols to exchange keys. The authentication header gives you authentication and integrity, but not confidentiality. It adds a digital signature to the attack. Um, and the ESP is the more common mode and probably the only one that should really exist, where it just encrypts everything and you get confidentiality and you can also have authentication and integrity. Uh, you, then I, IPsec, you create these things called security associations, which are one-way connections that are encrypted. And so you have to make two um, security associations for two-way transmission in ESP mode. And if you're using AH, you use four security associations. So there's quite a few of these handshakes and keys flying back and forth, although no key is directly ever sent in plain text. Of course, that would be insecure. It's sent with these protocols called ISACAMP and IKE, and these have ways to create a key and transmit information to agree upon a key over the internet without directly sending the key. 
There's a tunnel mode and a transport mode used to move the packets back and forth. Uh, one of them encrypts entire packets and puts them in other packets. The other mode just encrypts the data, but it doesn't encrypt the headers. Internet Key Exchange can use a variety of algorithms using MD5 or SHA-1, and it can run on triple DES or AES. Uh, one issue that occurs to me is I wonder if they're going to update this to SHA-2, and I suppose that's going to happen, but I'm not sure it's happened yet. Pretty Good Privacy is a system invented by Phil Zimmerman. He'd released it to the world in 1991, and as you may remember earlier, at that time, exporting powerful encryption out of the United States was a violation of federal law, so he got in big trouble, and they spent years in a legal battle, eventually the prosecutors dropped the case in 1996, presumably because of the Wassenaar Agreement, where the United States government finally decided to stop trying to stop people from exporting cryptography. Uh, the te this technique is in, can be used in a mode that is free and does not involve trusting certificate authorities. Instead, you trust people. So users have key signing parties where they vouch that if, if Fred has a key, and you don't know Fred, but your friend Joe knows Fred, Joe will sign Fred's key. And since you trust Joe, you believe Joe when Joe tells you that's really Fred. And so this friend of a friend of a friend system is used to uh, give you some degree of confidence that you're actually using the right key. This is very impractical. It doesn't scale very well. It doesn't pass tests very well as being secure. And, and it's really only a way for an in-group of people that are in a club, like the club of advanced security practitioners, to trust one another. And the real internet uses the other system with certificate authorities for internet shopping and such. That's the system that really scales to the whole world. But this is an alternative system if you actually trust friends of a friend. S-MIME is used for uh, email attachments to encrypt them and it uses the public key infrastructure to encrypt them and authenticate them. There's escrowed encryption mentioned before, where somebody else has some of your keys. Um, this can be used to provide separation of duties so that uh, operations have to be re-examined by a second agency to complete the encryption. And also, as I was mentioning, this is a way law enforcement can have some access to the key and also preserve some privacy, perhaps. It might be that they only have part of the key and they have to get the other part from the company with a search warrant or something. There are quite a few such proposed systems, although none of them are currently enforced by law. In the United States, every year there are proposals to try to enforce this on the internet, and it may happen. The Clipper chip was one of the many disasters caused by the U.S. government and encryption that helped lead to the current atmosphere of hostility, where the mathematical and security professionals that design encryption routines are in general very suspicious of the government and very hostile to it, and very reluctant to cooperate with any government agencies in designing modern encryption schemes. The Clipper chip was announced by the United States government, and it was supposed to be built into devices. It used something called a skipjack cipher and uh, people felt very unhappy about being forced to use it, and it had security problems. Steganography is a system used by terrorists and other people where you hide the message so securely that you don't even know a message has been sent. You will do something like take a picture and then post it up to a public image board like Flickr, and so that your person that is receiving the message knows, take the 10th kitten on Flickr from this day and look in that there was a secret message hidden in that image. Other people don't even know there's a message there at all. Digital watermarks are a similar technology where you put some kind of fingerprint in a file and now if it's say a music or a movie and somebody makes an unauthorized copy of it, you can track down whose movie was copied and punish them for copyright infringement. So that's an issue. For some reason, this has never become popular, and the Recording Industry Association of America and the Motion Picture Association of America instead spend a lot of their time trying to track down IP addresses of people that are copying music and trying somehow to tie those IP addresses to people. Uh, it seems like a much more complicated way to do it, but that is the current way it's done. So we got some more cahoots. I hope you're not hearing too much of the doors slamming. It sounds like the uh, contestants have come back and everybody's running back to this hotel after the first day of meetings to prepare for the contest. 
I left a little early to teach this class. <coughs> All right, I think we have about six cahooters. There's four. Five, good. I'll wait another five seconds. See if we're going to get six. Ah, there we go. Good. Five questions. Okay, how long should an RSA key be? All right, the current recommendation is 2,048 bits. It was 1,024 until a couple of years ago, but now it is recommended that you have to have at least 2,048 bits in the public key or RSA is not strong enough. All right, what attack defeats two deaths? All right, meet in the middle, reduces two deaths to one death, and that's why three deaths is the system that's actually strong enough to use. All right, what attack deduces the key from electric power consumption? Okay, that's side channel, where something else leaks out information which is used to find the key, thus messing up this mathematics, the mathematics makes an assumption that all you have is the ciphertext to work with, and in real equipment, you often have other information available. All right, what system ensures authenticity of public keys? Okay, that's the public key infrastructure, that structure of certificate authorities and so on that sign things and verify them and give you a high degree of confidence that you know who you're actually talking to. All right, what system uses AH and ESP? <laughs> All right, that's IPsec. And by the way, I ought to reiterate something I told you the first day. The thing about the CISSP is it's a mile wide and an inch deep. You notice there's a lot of subtlety inside IPsec, a lot of complexity that I just glossed over, because for the CISSP exam, you don't really have to know enough to implement it. You just have to pretty much know what terms are associated with it in a general way. <coughs> anyway, so it's Al is the highest score here. All right, we got one more section to go through, which I think is physical security. Yeah, perimeter defenses. <coughs> Things like fences, a three foot fence is a deterrent. It might stop some attackers, but it won't stop anybody who's making any serious effort to get in. A preventive fence would be eight feet in America as the standard with barbed wire on top. Now people can climb over that too, but that's considered that that will really stop most attackers. Then there are gates. There's ornamental gates, which are again a deterrent like the three foot fence. They'll just sort of remind people to stay out of here for politeness. And then there's various levels of gates up to the class four, which is a crash gate, where even if people try to smash through it with a truck or a car, they won't get in. And that's what you should use for something high security like an airport or a prison. Bollards are very common. These posts that go out, they're often ornamental. The purpose of these is to stop people from driving cars into a space. And it could be for a reason as simple as just to keep it safe to walk in there. But increasingly these days, people are concerned about terrorism and they're afraid that someone will have a truck full of explosive and bring it near your building like they did in uh, Oklahoma City and blow up the whole building. So they put these bollards up there to make it difficult to drive a vehicle close to a building. Lights are quite valuable. They can be detective so that people can see things and so that your cameras can record things, or they can be deterrent 
where they scare people away. Uh, it's a well-known result of studies that if you have a business and you leave lights on inside and outside all night, it's much less likely to get burgled because the burglars don't want to get be visible while they're doing it. Closed circuit television is the classic detective control. You have a visual recording of what's going on in there and who's walking through. Um, there are many generations of these. Some of them are analog. Some could see in the dark. Uh, of course, they have limitations. They can only see a certain amount. They may not be able to pan and tilt and focus. Um, but, you know, in general, this is a very good way to record what happened. It doesn't prevent anything, but it lets you re record what happened so you can see who's guilty later. Locks are, of course, the standard. Everybody's locking suitcases and doors and everything. Uh, locks are much, much less secure than people think they are. The locks people use in America are a sin and a shame. Uh, they won't stop anybody that even makes the slightest attempt to pick them. You can't even sell these locks in Germany. Uh, nobody else is able to see them. Now, I got a message telling me my internet connection is unstable. So if you people are having trouble hearing me, please send a chat message. It looks to me like I'm still connected, but I was afraid this might happen in my hotel internet when the students get back and start doing things. So if anybody has trouble connecting, please send me a chat message and hopefully I'll see it. Anyway, um, so you can pick locks. This is very easy to do. I have my students do it on their first day of class. Any ordinary person can learn in half an hour to pick an American lock. You have two tools. One of them is the tension wrench that turns the lock with gentle tension. And then you just reach in with any kind of pointy object and push the pins up until the lock turns. It turns out to be very easy to do because the lock is sort of sloppily made. So really, when you're trying to turn it and it won't turn, there's only one pin that's actually catching. And you can move that pin until it releases, and then it will turn a little bit. And now one more pin will catch because the locks, to make them cheaper, are made with high tolerances, and the holes and pins are not exactly identical. Bump keys are the simplest way. You shave a key down to the bottom of every uh, place that can be at a variable height, and then you just tap it with a screwdriver that causes the pins to sort of bounce up randomly, and within a few minutes, they will just randomly hit the right combination, and the clock will turn. There are master keys, which will open a wide variety of doors, doors in a security zone. If you are at an enterprise that has many locks, they will arrange to have these master keys for people like janitors and such and security personnel. And there's a core key that will remove the lock core if you're going to have locks with interchangeable cores to make it easy to rekey them. These combination locks are also considered a weak control. Uh, these master locks that appear to have 36 numbers do not really have 36 numbers. And they, um, you can, there are patterns, ways to turn them and just feel the tension on the thing uh, by pulling it apart while you turn. And you can sort of mathematically calculate what the uh, correct combination is. There's videos on YouTube showing you how to do this. Button and keypad locks are also weak because after a while the keys wear down and you can even look at them sideways or put dust on them and see which ones have fingerprint grease on them so you can find out which ones people have been pressing. And they're vulnerable to brute force attacks where you just try every possible combination. And they're vulnerable to shoulder surfing attacks. You can just stand near someone or put a camera nearby and watch them press the keys and learn what the combination is that way. Smart cards contain a computer chip. This is what we all have in our credit cards now in America. And now they have a uh, RFID card. Uh, it can be contacted, which is the kind in credit cards, or it can be contactless where you can read it from a distance, but it actually has a computer chip and the most common type has an antenna that receives energy from the reader, then does a calculation and replies, and that can be a proper public key cryptographic handshake that is very difficult to forge and different every time. So it can really be quite secure. Mag stripe cards have data stored on one stripe of magnetic material but it's really much less secure because usually it never changes. It's really just a fixed quantity. Here's the Department of Defense CAC smart cards that everybody has to have, the common access card, and American credit cards have a similar chip in them now. All right, you can follow a person through a secure door. 
Uh, you can either just rush up to them without them noticing you're behind them, or you can just hope that politely they'll let you in rather than slamming the door in your face. Uh, if you want to prevent people from getting in this way, you have to have a policy, security awareness training, and tests where you actually have people out there at your company trying to sneak through doors and punishing people who let them through. Man traps are a good solution. You have two doors. The first door closes and locks and you're trapped inside a little room and then you have to do something different to open the second door, like a thumbprint or something. So an intruder that tries to sneak in will find themselves trapped in a room and you can just look in the window and decide they're no good and call the cops and they're just trapped in there. Turnstiles are an attempt to make sure that people, only one person goes through per swipe, but it's pretty easy to jump over them. And uh, both of these have the issue of how, what do you do if there's a fire or other emergency? There ought to be some way to open it, or you're going to have the legal liability of people being trapped in there. All right, then there's uh, systems that try to identify forbidden objects when you're entering a place like an airplane, like weapons. This can turn out to be pretty easy to detect large metal objects, but it's very difficult to make sure that they're not sneaking in storage devices with SD cards. This is why people are very, very nervous about USB sticks, SD cards, DVDs. It is very difficult to be sure that people are not sneaking unauthorized copies of data out of your network. Motion detectors come in various types. Um, they can send out some kind of signal like ultrasonic or microwave and watch the reflected signal and see if it changes. There are photoelectric ones that send a beam across a space and detect when the beam is broken. Uh, these are all ways to uh, set alarms off if people are walking where they shouldn't be or to detect motion and open the door because you think someone is trying to leave a burning building. Uh, there are magnetic door and window alarms that detect when windows are broken or open and then they set off an alarm or alert a security professional, uh, security guard. Your doors should be arranged so the hinges are on the inside so an attacker can't take the hinges apart from the outside and get in. Uh, your motion sensors can be a weak spot. This is a common way to break into things like banks in penetration tests. I had a visitor come demonstrate this and talk to us about it. You can just blow up a balloon through the bottom of bank doors so it deflates and spurts around in there or spray any kind of steam into that or even done it by spitting a mouthful of whiskey in through the rubber crack in a door to create motion on the inside, which causes the door to open because the motion sensor thinks someone is trying to flee a fire. Windows are, of course, risky. You can just smash the glass and get through. Uh, you can get stronger glass to prevent this or put wire mesh or a film on it that makes it harder to clash, to crack or just buy glass that's bulletproof or otherwise uh, made of a stronger material. Walls, floors, and ceilings are often a weak spot. Uh, many companies, many buildings, the ceilings are actually just loose panels and there's a gap above them that you can just crawl through to get to other rooms. So you avoid this by making the walls go slab to slab, no gaps at the bottom or the top. And uh, you can consider, you also have to consider the fire rating of your walls. Uh, the fire rating determines how easy it is for a fire in one room to spread to another room. So you have guards. Uh, there are professional guards that may come trained in combat and other skills. And then there's the mall cops that you get, the kind you see at Safeway and other stores who are not very highly trained, not very expensive. They don't have a gun. They're not supposed to fight with people. All they're supposed to do is observe and report and call the real cops when there's trouble. Um, all right, but you have to make it very clear to them what their rules are, what their limitations are. Uh, dogs are fine too. They're both deterrent and detective. A lot of people, when they hear a dog barking, will just give up and go break into some other building rather than deal with the dog. Um, sometimes people get killed by dogs though, and sometimes people panic about dogs, so there may be some liability from having them, but they generally make you a lot more uh, resistant to burglars. Uh, if you have secure areas in your environment where people are working on things, papers and projects that shouldn't be seen by the general public, then you make people wear visitor badges so they know that this is a visitor and the visitors should only go in this area and not that area. And you can have different badge colors for each day and a printed name and date on each badge and all that. So it's easy for your security staff to verify whether someone should really be wandering around your building or not. 
You can also design your site and choose the location to make it more secure. Hills, valleys, and trees, which you can alter with landscaping, can help a lot. You don't, should not have any area of concealment near your building, like a bush or a tree, so someone can hide in while they're trying to break in or attack people entering and leaving. You can choose the um, location based on the amount of crime in the neighborhood and on the security of the utilities. These will all be dependent on where you choose to locate your building. You can mark the site. You typically do not want to mark a site unless you really want the public to find it and go there like a store. Uh, if it is not a place that does direct interaction with your customers, then you typically don't label it or put up a false label that gives someone the false impression of what it is. Um, if you are sharing a building with other people, then their poor security might affect yours as they let strangers wander in and then it can be a problem. It may, your physical security may be compromised because they're letting people in the building and wandering through the halls and your electronic security may be compromised because they, people can get in your building and get close enough to connect to your wireless network. Your wireling closets must be secured. If someone can actually tamper with the wires and equipment in the wiring closet, they can certainly get at your network traffic and probably cause disruptions and perhaps steal secrets. Uh, there is a DMARC. The DMARC is the location in your building where your internet service providers or telephone providers' responsibility ends. They do not provide service to your computer. They provide service to your building, to the DMARC, and then the interior wiring that goes from the DMARC to the devices in your building are your responsibility. And if you may have a shared wiring closet for all the um, companies sharing a building, and again, it's a problem. If the other people are sloppy, they can endanger your security. Your server rooms need to have separate physical access controls so that even people who succeed in entering your building have to go through another layer of approval to get in the server room because that's where you have your really important equipment that you don't want to have anyone tampering with, breaking, or stealing. And also, the server room typically needs environmental control. You want to maintain the temperature and humidity carefully in that room for the equipment. Uh, where you store your media, your tapes and backups and removable hard drives and such, uh, is also has to be secured because that is your confidential company data. You need to make sure nobody is messing with it so it's available when you need it, and you need to make sure nobody's stealing the data off it because that would be a data breach. It may also need environmental controls to make sure it's not exposed to high temperatures or otherwise damaged. All right, and then you've got system defenses. Uh, you, the whole philosophy here is defense in depth where you have controls at several stages of processing information. So if someone overcomes one barrier, for example, tailgate someone to get into a secure building, they will still find that there are further barriers protecting the most important data from them. So um, to keep people from getting physical access to a device or medium with sensitive information, you can track your assets with serial numbers so you know how many devices there are and you know if they're missing. You can uh, limit USB ports, you can just glue them shut, or you can push out a group policy that disables the USB ports, or that makes it so USB ports will only work for official authorized devices that have a signature on the USB stick. And for environmental controls, there are many ways electrical power can fail partially or completely, and that's bad, of course, for your equipment. It causes an outage, and it may damage the data stored on magnetic devices. So surge protectors are the cheapest defense that stop large spikes like lightning hitting the line somewhere. UPSs are much better, that use battery power to provide temporary power for a few minutes, so you have time to either shut down the device in an orderly fashion or to start up your generator so you can survive a long outage. As long as you have enough generator fuel, you can endure long periods of no line power. Another issue is electromagnetic interference. If you are using cables like Ethernet cable, you have wires going through there that are sending different signals, and the crosstalk is when the signal from one wire enters another. To prevent this, Ethernet cables have twisted pair, where each pair of wires is twisted a different number of turns per inch. So on average, the crosstalk will cancel out, but there is still a crosstalk problem at the end of the wire. And if um, unshielded twisted pair is also susceptible to electromagnetic interference from the outside from things like fluorescent lights, 
shielded twisted pair or coaxial table is much more resistant because there is a braid on the outside that is at ground that attenuates the electrical signals from the outside and fiber optic is considered completely immune to electromagnetic interference because the pulses of infrared light passing through the glass are not affected by any electrical signal from the outside. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning is important, of course. You want to have positive pressure in the building so that dust is being blown out of the building instead of being sucked in. Your data center should have humidity around 50% and temperature around 68 to 77 degrees. Uh, if the humidity is lower than that, you have static charge as people walk around and they're shocking things and breaking equipment. If you have higher than that, then water condenses on the devices and causes corrosion of the contacts. All right, that's the game here. You have airborne contaminants. Dust is bad for computers and other devices, so it's good to have air filters and have positive pressure to clean the dust out of the air and blow the dust out of your secure room. Your heat detectors are just thermometers. Smoke detectors use ionization or photoelectric beams to detect smoke in the air. And flame detectors detect infrared or ultraviolet light, and it, these can then uh, set off alarms, turn on sprinklers, and other fire suppression equipment. You have to train your personnel how to evacuate with fire drills and such. You have a safety warden making sure people go to the meeting point and meeting point leader, make sure that you count all the people and make sure they all got out. You have to consider handicapped people and you have to avoid using elevators that cannot be trusted at a fire. Uh, there are warning systems that warn you for other things like severe weather, a terrorist attack, chemical spills, and so on. If fire extinguishers are rated in five ratings, A is just plain old water or something like foam that just stops wood and paper from burning. B is for flammable liquids like liquids and grease. The most important one for us and on the CISSP exam is type C, which is for energized electrical equipment. That's the type of extinguisher you would use in a computer room. And D is for combustible metals, which is very exotic and not usually a concern. And K is for kitchen fires. So the methods to stop a fire, you either lower the temperature, remove the oxygen, remove the fuel, or interfere with the chemical operation. One of those things must be accomplished to put out the fire. Water is good for paper or wood. Um, soda or acid works too in wet chemicals and dry powder. These are all various options. CO2 is much better for the computers, but it can kill people if they push all the oxygen out of the room. Another technique people used in the past was halon. This suffocates fires without, this stops the fire without suffocating people. But the problem with halon is it, uh, after you've used it, it escapes into the air and goes up and depletes the ozone. So it's illegal to use for new deployments. And there are substitute systems, substitute chemicals using argon or FM200 or these other chemicals. All right. Uh, you typically have a warning before you deploy these things so personnel can evacuate. And uh, all right, this also allows personnel to stop the release in case it's a false alarm. You have sprinkler systems of various types. Some of them have water waiting in the pipe, others don't. Uh, of course, sprinkling water on electrical equipment is really bad and you're gonna break your servers doing that. So this is something you would not normally wanna use in a server room, but it's good to save the, the building itself and the people in the building for other rooms. All right. And here's the last cahoots for the night. Oh, a question. What type of locks? Uh, I don't know how long he's been there. Uh, what you mean on server rooms? Yeah, he has never mind. Anyway, it does remind me to mention on server rooms, you should generally um, have uh, may, uh, video surveillance and electronic card swipe locks so you keep a record of who went in and when they went in in case somebody does something bad in the server room. All right, so this is the last Kahoot. All right. There's the number, a five digit number.
All right, I'll wait another five seconds. Oh, I think five is all we have. We've lost someone. We'll carry on with this. Five questions. Okay, which one of these is a deterrent? Okay, that's the three foot fence. Doesn't really prevent anything, but it might scare some attackers away. If you shave a key down to the lowest position, what have you got? That's a bump key. All right. And what's a smart card? They're called ICCs. Not quite sure what it stands for. I think it's integrated circuit card, but I might have that wrong. Which extinguisher is just water? All right, that's A, although I think they often use other chemicals. It can be as simple as just water. All right, what countermeasure stops EMI? That's electromagnetic interference, and fiber optics is not subject to it. All right, so Al's the winner. Uh, that's it for this one. I think the next ones won't be as long. I'll wait a minute or so to see if there are any questions. Other than that, I'll see you next week, same time. All right. I see a chat message. Okay. Kate, people are saying thanks. Jim, all right. You're not in yet, Jim Frost. Well, I hope it worked out. All right. Okay. Looks like people are okay. Out of town next week. Okay, Jim. Yeah, if anybody's out of luck, out of town, of course, there are always videos posted so you can review them. And thanks, KT. Good luck on the competition. I, uh, I think my team is going to do well. They seem to be very good. I'm not allowed to participate, but I do get to sort of cheer them on. All right. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Okay. I'm shutting it down now. Have a good week. All right.